This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Barbara Hensky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft and business of writing as we explore a new topic every week. Our guest today is Janet Fox. She has authored more than a dozen children's and books and YA novels. She is a book coach, has a substack under her name, and her new book, The Mystery of Mystic Mountain, is due out later in 2024. Uh, I really like the alliteration there of that title. Um, I was worried that I was going to mess it up saying it, but I, I like everything about that. Uh, so Janet, welcome to The Right Approach. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm really uh, excited about today's conversation. Um, we're here to talk about developing characters through their backstory wounds um mm -hmm. which is uh i try to give all manner of wounds to the characters that i write I, and i think this is something that people can fairly easily identify with um mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. particularly i think um with all the marvel movies that have come out in the last 15 mm -hmm. years and the dc comic movies this is a a trope for comic book characters when you think of uh batman particularly Absolutely. And yeah. with, with, you know, Superman, yeah. all those folks, even, but not even all Thor, <laughs> even Thor, but not all backstory <laughs> wounds are so overt as those. Um, yeah. So why don't you introduce us to the topic and why it's of interest to you? And then we'll go from there. Great. I'd love to. Yes. First, I want to credit Lisa Crone, who introduced me to that idea and, you know, the two of her seminal books, um, uh, story genius, I'm looking at them right now, and um, Wired for Story. And those really brought to my attention how important that backstory wound is for a developing character. Because I like to think of characters as having four sort of primal drivers in a story. That's one of them. Their flaw is the second one. A, a long-standing internal desire or lack or want or need that drives them as a third. And of course the external story goal is the fourth. So when I work with character in my stories, that's where I start with those four big things. But backstory wound, I think is one of those that um, is hard for some writers to know how to apply then to the mm -hmm. story without telling the reader what's going on. So um, that's why I did this analysis and have been, have been working through this analysis for a while to help my writers, the writers that I work with and my coaching business and in my, my new course program, how they can then create a character that exhibits those wounds on the page um, in a showing fashion, how to, and how to mm -hmm. take that wound and actually make it apply to their character specifically that you know, there are a number of ways you can go with the, with the wound and how it affects the character as they grow and develop. What's a good example of that that we can kind of work with in the conversation? Maybe something that's a go-to for you as a reference. Yeah, the I mean the one I I since I write for children, I always like to start with a backstory wound that's applicable to younger children because then I can um, build my character, and I don't need to build it from adolescence onward. I can build it from young childhood onward. So I think of uh, the example of a kid whose parents are divorcing. And if, if you know people whose parents have divorced, and I, and I have many friends whose parents have divorced, um, they often uh, take that on as their own problem. They made the problem. They made their parents separate. They made their parents argue. It's their fault. They were bad in some fashion. They made a mistake. They didn't, you know, they didn't do something right. They misbehaved. And so it's quite natural for a young child to assume that they're at fault for something that happens in the family. When of course that isn't true, but that is a wound. That's a wounding experience. Bullying is another wounding experience that a young child might experience um, in school or at on the playground or failure of some kind. You know, a failure to to achieve some small goal, even a very small goal, or a loss, a loss like uh, the loss of a pet or a grandparent or um, uh, any kind of loss. That, again, in school, that's that seems relatively minor. But when a child assimilates the blame and the guilt for it, it can sort of begin to grow and fester. And that's where the wound starts. 
So that's where I would start as a character is what what kind of uh, situation can I create for my character way back before my story began? You know, it, it's funny. I when I work with writers, I have to remind them constantly. Hey, you know, your story didn't begin on page one of your book. <laughs> it actually began long, long before you you put the first scene on the page. So. So that's what I try to do is to create those characters or advise them to create those characters way back before. And my advice is to create five potential wounding things, wounding scenes, whether that's bullying, whether that's divorce, whether that's a loss, um, whatever that is. And then to choose the one that they think feels most compelling, feels most like personal to them, because I think when we write characters, the more we can internalize their pain in our own experiences, the better we can develop them on the page. So, you know, I think you referenced this earlier. It's important to, you know, you have this, this event or this occurrence, these things that happen, right. and you need right. to build them into your character without the character saying, I am exhibiting this behavior because my parents divorced <laughs> yeah. and I am hurt over that because first of right. all, most of us don't have that self-awareness. Exactly. Um, and, you know, second of all, that doesn't make good for good storytelling. So what are right. some yeah. methods yeah, the, you use? Yeah. The Go old ahead, and Barbara. famous, as you know, Sally. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Which I, which Sally already knew. So she's known that for a long time. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's lazy. yeah, you want to avoid that telling moment, right? Yeah. yeah so, sorry. so what I, what I suggest is after they've developed the, um, the scenes to pick that one scene, then create the emotions that might arise in that moment from that scene, guilt, um, is, is primary regret, uh, self-doubt, self-blame, um, uh, all of those emotions. And then as the character grows and it's it's like a festering wound that they they've just tried to ignore and and maybe buried in bandages. And the bandages are are the problem, right? The bandages are what make for uh, us as humans to seek therapy in in adulthood. Mm -hmm. And so if you think of your character as having this um, wound that they're trying to, to just hide or ignore, then they're gonna create an emotional response to it, which is I'm gonna avoid this situation every way that I can. If if I feel like in this in the specific case of say divorce, okay, it's my fault that my parents divorced, I'm the guilty party, um, I'm being abandoned as a result of my behavior. So I'm gonna avoid both the behavior and the abandonment in the future. And, and avoiding abandonment means withdrawing, means the character emotionally withdraws from situations. And, and that can manifest in so many different behaviors. It can, be, it can result in a behavior of um, being you know, quiet and withdrawn, or it can, be, it can result in a behavior that's aggressive, but aggressive in that certain way of, you know, you're not gonna abandon me kind of aggression um and so what you take is you take the emotions and then you create the the behaviors that manifest from those emotions and then from the behaviors you can create bannerisms which is what stage actors do when they're studying characters and their emotions that they want to portray on the stage is to find those ticks or mannerisms or be, you know those external behaviors um, that that show the internal emotional uh, state of their character that they're portraying on the stage. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And right. yeah, when you're Do talking you of examples, specific examples from on the stage. Well, the one that the the one that I really like is the way <laughs> the way that Marlon Brando uh, portrayed the Godfather. You know, Corleone in the in the mm -hmm. Godfather. Um, he is so withdrawn in some ways, but so aggressive in others. And if you watch his facial tics or his his gestures, his body language, um, 
you can see the aggression that is sort of suppressed beneath his kind of gentle external um, mannerisms. Uh, and so that's one that's one good example. Um, I'll, I'll be thinking of another as we talk, but uh, that, well, I that's can tell one you that one that like, came to me yeah, go ahead. as Joe were yeah. talking about this was yeah. in Hamilton, Alexander yeah. Hamilton, mm -hmm. uh, which I think I listened to that. I mean, hundreds of times just listening yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, he had this childhood that was devastating and he was yeah. sick and lost his mother and yeah. born in, you yeah. know, this poor island in the Caribbean got to New York and lived every day as if there wasn't going to be another. And that ambition yes. just seemed yeah. like it was brought through, you know, those mm -hmm. early experiences of losing right. everything and everyone. And, right. you know, as you were talking, that just seemed like that really fit the bill. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I th And I think, you know, right. we can see that in, in, as you mentioned, and even in the Marvel movies, all of those characters with those backstory wounds, you, you know, you see the, you can see the fear that results from Batman's experience in the cave, but also his desire to avenge his parents, but in a certain specific way. It's the way that he does this. You know, he's hiding behind a mask, <laughs> and which is sort of perfect. That's the, the ultimate bandage, right, over the wound, <laughs> and and so he's. He's hiding behind the mask in order to execute his revenge, but only in that certain way that revenges, avenges his parents um, and his own loss. And, um, and yet it's, it's a twisted sort of loss, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's twisted into a combination of fear and anger and yet um, desire to do good, which is a, another twist. And so, yeah, all of his external behaviors then uh, are a result of that wounding experience of loss and that, and of course the experience in the well with the bat. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are so many, we, if you start to take apart all those examples, you can, you can track how the best actors in the best movies really do um, dive deep into those wounds in order to portray characters that are really three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. yeah so you were talking early on about the character work that you do and the correct you know to develop things and you mentioned uh, both the wound and also mm -hmm. the character's flaw and mm -hmm. I was wondering is there always a correlation between the flaw and the wound mm -hmm. oh, that's a great question I don't think I've really examined that as deeply as I should, but I would say that there there really has to be, because when we hide our wound, which is what what you want the character to do is not to have gone through therapy and result all this stuff <laughs> until maybe after your book is done, um, or maybe during the course of your book. Um, so if you're if you've got a, a complex character who's working through this stuff. Yeah, I think the flaw is definitely a part of the wound. And let's let's take the experience of someone who is bullied as a child. Um, as an example, um, someone who is bullied is often likely to turn into a bully later. It's just a response to being, I mean, you, you could say that they would turn into someone who's who retreats and hides and, and buries themselves. But a lot of bullies... Uh, um, result from bullying and um, and if they're so if the person who is the is bullied then becomes a bully that that's obviously their flaw right their their flaw is that they're just going to push everyone else out of their way they're they're going to be as aggressive as possible as nasty as possible and that's a that's a flaw I mean that's for sure a flaw and mm -hmm. it's only by working through through that uh, that feeling that they need to put other people around them down, whether whether it's a physical bully or whether it's an emotional bully, um, psychological bullying, all of those parameters, that's a flaw. And it would definitely uh, make a hero who either, if it's a if it's a tragedy, is never going to figure that out, is never going to discover 
the nature that of their um, evil, or maybe they're the antagonist, um, or it's going to make for a protagonist who struggles to resolve this behavior in some fashion and has to go through your story, uh, dragging this baggage, but trying to, to unload it, trying to get rid of it, trying to deal with it, trying to work through their flaw um, in order to achieve the positive result at the end of the story. So um, this is why I love this whole notion is because you can create any character and a series of complexities and at every stage of your decision, as you write your story, you, you make the choice. Is your character gonna go in that direction or that direction? Now, you, if, you're, if you're a writer and you're writing the whole story, generally speaking, you have an idea where you want your story to end up before you even start writing it, right? And so the, this is the kind of train you can make, the kind of trail that you can create, the cause and effect that you can create to get to the end result that you want. Um, and, but you can take it through any number of paths to get there. And I think that makes for an interesting and more complex nuance and layered story. As I think about the novels that I've written and I write for adults, um, mm -hmm. you know, my, I have a trilogy and then a couple of others. And I'm, as I think about the characters, it wasn't usually that, you know, their backstory was the point was the point of the plot, you know, that wasn't right. carrying right. the story, um, but right. it certainly colored who they were and how they interacted with the world around them, um, you know, and carried themselves throughout the story. And then sometimes those things would come to the forefront and, you know, you would learn about some of the backstory as it was relevant or needed right. as part of the story. Um, and so I, I wonder if, if in writing children's books that differs um, and mm -hmm. if for you, those tend to be at the forefront of the story and dealing with those issues or what your experience is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I, I don't think it's very different, honestly. I mean, there are two things to your question here. One is the actual technical aspect of backstory and the other is, than um, the, the fact that I'm writing for children. So technically, um, I, I try to put backstory as far into the story as possible. So in other words, if, if I've identified this backstory wound, whatever it is, however small it is or big it is, um, I, don't just, I don't write a scene that goes into the beginning of the story. It comes out either uh, just sort of in whispers, you know, bit by bit as I tell the story. Or if I think I need a scene at some point that explains this person's behavior, I might put it in as a memory inspired by something in that moment of the story that's way back in there. Um, but I try to leave it not, I don't try not to put it technically, as it were, in the beginning of the story. So writing for children, most of those wounding experiences are going to be small, right? Because I'm dealing with a at the, a lot of my characters in a in a picture book. That's a whole different matter that goes for I think that could be a whole long discussion for another day. But in a middle grade novel, I'm dealing with a character who's who's usually twelve. So it's not going to be something. Um, I mean, there can be a terrible traumatic experience by the age of twelve. But let's say the character is dyslexic just as an example that's a wounding mm -hmm. experience because you feel inadequate you feel stupid maybe the people around you think you're stupid because they don't understand dyslexia and and you're manifesting it by not you can't read so you're embarrassed you don't want to be in school you don't want to go to school um, but you still love stories or you still love you know the you know telling stories or being a part of uh, the, the school experience so for that character, the dyslexia is then manifested in, in that behavior of however the character manifests. So she could be um, aggressive, like, you know, I'm not stupid. Or she could be withdrawn, 
you know, and, and withdraw from the whole thing and hide in the back of the classroom because she doesn't want to be seen. She doesn't want the teacher to call on her. So she's never going to raise her hand. Or it could be the opposite. She raises her hand every single time because <laughs> she wants to make a point. So um, I don't usually then let the reader know specifically that she's dyslexic because whether that's a, a wound that she's had from birth. So that will appear in the course of the story as, as a clear sort of inability to read, you know, inability to, to, um, to grasp the concept of the book that she's got in her hand or trying so hard or having someone read it to her or finding an audible um, book, whatever that is, I weave it into the story. So it's not, it's not um, something I throw in, in the reader's face. So yeah, for writing for kids, it is different than writing for adults in that you're manifesting tinier behaviors over a longer period of time, I think, than creating a big wounding mm -hmm. experience that then you'll show maybe late in the story. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I'm going to go back to the technical aspect of using backstory. Sure. Um, Barb, you look like you had a thought. So if you've got something. No, no, I think that's, that's where I was going. So, so carry on. Okay. Great. Because I think it's done poorly a lot. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And so yes. <laughs> one of the things, and I don't know where to attribute it, but I listen to a lot of story theory and read a lot of story theory. Sure. And, yeah. and it's important to get the reader fully invested in the present right. before delving into the mm -hmm. past. Could you elaborate on that for us? Sure. Um, yeah, that is so true. Uh, you really need to engage the reader in the character's present emotional state from page one. Mm -hmm. And and so what you need to know, you need to know all this stuff. You need to know their backstory wound. You need to know their flaw. You need to know their goal and their, their internal desire um, or longing or lack or whatever it is. Um, but you don't want to dump that on the reader on page one what you want to do is create then this situation which is the plot the story you want to create the situation that you're going to put that character in that's going to force them the character to face emotionally to face all of these things that you have planted in in them as as you've developed them as a character. I always say, start with the character, start with the character, start with their emotional state. So if you're, and I write, um, I've, I've been writing um, middle grade fantasies or middle grade contemporaries. And um, and so what I start with, and I'll, I'll just use an example. Um, my most recent middle grade novel, Carry Me Home is a story about two girls living in a car. So they're homeless. Um, I don't, tell the reader what's going on in terms of this main character's backstory. She's 12. She's trying to take care of herself and her sister. Their dad has suddenly disappeared, left them in this car. She doesn't want to tell anybody what their situation is because she's afraid that that will get them in trouble. She's afraid that they'll be separated. Um, and so she's hiding all of this stuff. We don't know what her backstory is. We just know that her emotional state is fragile. And of course it's fragile because she's in this situation. We don't find out that their mother died uh, of an illness until halfway through the story. So I don't let the reader know any of that. Um, I just let the reader know here they are in this bad situation and she's trying to deal with it. And this is how she's trying to deal with it. So it's all about her emotions in that moment, trying to, to keep herself and her sister safe trying to hide their situation from the authorities, um, trying to pretend something that she isn't. So all of those, the emotions that she's carrying, which are tucked inside her fear, her determination, her living every minute as it is, um, that's how she's, she's manifesting this by not telling people what, she's going through so that she can get the help that she actually needs mm -hmm. um and 
And in the end, she has to learn how to ask for help. So her arc of story, her total arc of story is the learning curve that I have to force her through by making her miserable in the, in the moment, I mean, as, as a writer. Um, but that's what she has to learn is how to ask for help in a situation. Um, and the wound is only part of that because mom is gone. Mom is dead and she experienced that. So she's experienced this loss and, and doesn't know how to deal with a new loss, as it were, if that makes sense. I have to say, I want to just interject that, Jeremy, your soon to come out book, Watch Party, I think deals masterfully with a whole bunch of wounds, a whole bunch of backstory, just sprinkle. sprinkle. Yeah, there's a lot of hurting people in there. A lot of hurting people. <laughs> and it could have been real heavy and real boring. Mm. Um, mm. Frankly, for, and probably would have forced a lot of readers out of the story if you had just done the dump, but you did. You handled it so well. Well, I was thinking yes. about using this in the same way that we use a lot of other setting elements. And, mm -hmm. and I was thinking mm -hmm. about Watch Party, mm -hmm. which there's some folks in a private plane that get in a plane crash, uh, end up on a an uninhabited island in the Caribbean, and lots of terrible wow. things happen. And so wow. I had to do a ton of research about private jets and sure. about what kind of vegetation or animal life might be on an uninhabited island in the Caribbean. Sure. And then yeah. about hurricanes and weather and like all sorts of stuff, but you're not going to use most of that. No, you're only right. going to implement as much as, or as minimal as necessary for what the story calls for and exactly. when it calls for it, but not before. And so I think that correlates really well with what you were saying about, you know, informing the reader and informing is probably the wrong usage of that, but, you know, bringing, bringing it into the story is right. when it's appropriate and only in the amounts necessary. Um, and cause you're not going to just dump all of it at any given no. point in time. And so I right. think that, you know, those same principles that we use for setting, um, can apply toward how we reveal yeah. backstory as well. Yeah, absolutely right. And if, in fact, if you think of it, it's like seasoning, right? <laughs> if you over season the soup, it, you, it's inedible. So, yeah. so I would say use that backstory as seasoning where it's needed and where you can weave it in in a completely natural way. You know, in in the case of Carry Me Home, I don't, I I don't think that I've ever revealed to my main character's friends in this new environment ever in this story that mom is dead and that she witnessed it mm. it's, it's it just isn't part of the, the of the current story it's part of her character so um so the but the idea is there and as you say it's just like setting where you know you know you know how many you know what what the actual type of tree is you know exactly what the what the uh, weather will be like but you may never use it except in reference in sort of an, an implied way, you know, but that's, and that's, yeah, I think that's a really good analogy. You know, we started this interview with information about yourself and you talked about a course or maybe a new course that you're teaching. I'm interested in that. Tell Oh, tell thank you. Thank you for asking. That. Um, yeah, I, I, um, you know, I've been in this industry for 25 years. So, um, I feel like I have a lot of uh, understanding and knowledge and craft and love, love to explore it like you do. And um, uh, I toyed with the idea, I have an MFA in writing for children and young adults. And I toyed with the idea when I was in that program of going back and teaching there. Well, COVID happened. And so I began um, book coaching one-on-one -on -one with students and I just found it so satisfying to share this information, um, but I was sharing it with one person at a time. And I thought, you know, I really, what I, I could either write a book, which I could do, um, or I could create a series of courses and put them online. And so I chose the latter and I've created um, about 50 hours of, of uh, course material and a number of lessons that's, you know, from soup to nuts um, wow. for writing for children. And I've created a program 
that people could join um, and become part of this membership uh, group. And they have access to all those courses. Plus, we have Zoom meetings uh, twice a month. Plus, uh, I have a, 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 a private group meeting room where we can ask questions and interact and they can make uh, connections with other writers. So um, I feel like it's, I mean, that's sort of a legacy project, if you will, for me, leaving a lot of this information I have and I'm adding to it all the time, um, stuff that I know about writing and uh, stuff that I think is important for people to know. And I'm, I'm very happy with it. And I, I, I think my students are too. So it's very and satisfying. Where's, where's the best place wow. to access that? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, it's called Fox's Den. And if they go to my website, which mm -hmm. is JanetSFox.com, uh, they'll see uh, right at the menu at the top, Fox's Den, and they can look at that and then look at the whole program, see what I offer and join uh, um, right there. So uh, I would love to have, I would love to have more students. It's, uh, it, I feel very good about it. I feel like I've really put a whole, my whole heart and knowledge into it. So, yeah. Sounds very interactive. I mean, it sounds it very, is very interactive. Yeah. I, I like really that. Part of it. Yeah. Much more Thank so you. Than, than a book, I think. Well, that's that was that was sort of my <laughs> feeling. It feels more like I'm in the classroom, yeah. you know, with people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So fun. Well, this is a very uh natural place for us to bring the interview to a close. Um, I don't know if you have social media that you use regularly, um, but if so, tell us what you use and also if you have a other website of uh, uh, where your, your books are and that sort of thing, apart from um, your courses, let us know that too. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, now Janet S. Fox is, is my home. It has everything on it. My books, um, my other courses, because I have some static courses. That's where I started, but I, I like this group even more, um, Fox's Den. So uh, JanetSFox.com. And then I am on Instagram um, under Janet S. Fox. Uh, I am on Facebook, uh, Janet S. Fox and Pinterest as well. So um, you can find me on those three sites. And um, yeah, please follow me. Uh, I'd love to engage in conversation. If you have questions about craft, I, I really love talking about writing craft, clearly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, very good. Thank right. you.